Welcome to a Field Trip Toolbox video. You can visit us at fieldtriptoolbox.org. Welcome everybody. This is the first Field Trip uh, online tutorial. Uh, my name is Stephen Whitmarsh and in this uh, presentation I would like to explain to you the basics of MEG measurement. I've tried to keep it as simple and concise as possible and you will need no previous knowledge for this part. Uh, in this video I will explain to you how the brain generates magnetic fields, how the MEG picks up these fields and I will uh, go over several MEG systems that implement these techniques. Our story starts at the level of the neuron. As you know, neurotransmission occurs by chemical processes that result in electrical currents spreading from the presynaptic to the postsynaptic neuron. If we take a closer look, we see that the arrival of presynaptic action potential results in the release of neurotransmitters into the synaptic cleft. These neurotransmitters, glutamate in the case of most excitatory neurotransmissions, opens the receptors of the postsynaptic neuron. This lets in charged ions that depolarize the postsynaptic membrane, setting in motion the postsynaptic potential. It is this postsynaptic potential that we're able to record outside of the brain, not the presynaptic potential that caused it. There are several reasons for this. First of all, because the current of a single neuron is too small to be picked up outside of the brain, energy relies on the currents of many neurons summing up. However, the presynaptic action potential is very short-lived in the order of several milliseconds. Furthermore, it is biphasic, meaning that it has both a positive and a negative deflection, as you can see here in the orange trace. This means that spikes that are not perfectly synchronized will somewhat cancel each other out. Postsynaptic potentials, however, are much longer lived as well as monophasic, as you can see here in the blue trace. This allows for these deflections to add up more easily and therefore have a bigger chance of being measurable with MEG. Temporal synchronicity is not enough, however. The superposition also relies on the geometric configuration of the pyramidal cells, which have their dendritic trees oriented in parallel. Postsynaptic currents that are generated at the apical dendrites travel downwards towards their soma, enabling the currents to sum up. We therefore do not measure all neural activity. Dendrites of inhibitory interneurons, for instance, are not oriented systematically and therefore will not contribute to a measurable brain signal. Indirectly, however, their activity is picked up through their effect on the postsynaptic activity. You should be aware, therefore, that it is not always precisely clear what physiological processes we measure when we record electrical or magnetic activity. We encounter a similar problem in fMRI. And there we also talk about BOLT uh, and, and call it brain activity, but we don't really exactly know what the physiological origin of these signals are. But once we have a cortical patch with enough neurons firing at about the same time and generating currents that have a similar orientation, a measurable electrical current will be generated. With MEG we can measure the magnetic field that goes together with this electrical current. Specifically, we know from Maxwell's right-hand rule that a magnetic field curves around the axis of the electrical current. Like this. However, the magnetic fields that are generated by the brain are extremely small. We therefore first need to amplify them and we do that using flux transformers. Let me explain you how that works. A flux transformer consists of a large coil of about a square centimeter that is wired to a considerably smaller coil. These coils are both made of superconductive metal that is cooled down to almost absolute zero of about 4 Kelvin. At these temperatures the whole thing becomes superconducting. The bigger coil is positioned as close as possible to the head where it can best pick up the weak magnetic fields of the brain. The superconductivity is key here. As an effect of superconductivity, there is absolutely no resistance in the system in the two wires, in the two coils. As a consequence, no total magnetic field can occur within the system. Therefore, any magnetic field that impinges on the big coil will have to result in a magnetic field in the small coil that is equal to that, but going in the opposite direction. And because of the smaller size of the second coil, the flux will be stronger and more compressed. It is this amplified field that we're able to pick up using squids. Now let's take a look at the MEG system from a wider point of view. 
The largest bulk of the system consists of a large dewar containing the liquid helium for cooling down the flux transformers in the squids. From the squids on, the measured signal is amplified and then digitized and passed on to computers for display, storage and analysis. We can zoom out even further and if we do that we can see that the MEG system is placed in a magnetically shielded room, or MSR as we call it. All devices that might generate the magnetic fields are placed outside of it and so to reduce interference with the measurements. As we said, the magnetic fields are extremely small. They are about a million times smaller than the Earth magnetic field, which by itself is already about a hundred times smaller than your typical refrigerator magnet. We therefore need the MSR to keep out these interfering magnetic fields. We call this passive shielding. However, because of the properties of the mu metal and the fact that we need holes in the room to pass through our cables, uh, ambient noise will always be present. And because of this, MEG recordings also have to rely on smart sensor designs. To explain these smart sensor designs, uh, let's start with the sensitivity of the most simple sensor, the magnetometer. Imagine we have an active bunch of neurons generating an electrical current, here depicted in blue, which in turn creates a magnetic field, here depicted in green. Now, if you place the magnetometer, which is the big coil of the flux transformer, somewhat off-center to this source, the magnetic field will pass through it in an upward direction. This upward magnetic field can then be picked up by the squid that's coupled to the flux transformer. However, if we move the coil straight above the source, the coil will be oriented in the same plane as the magnetic field and no net magnetic flux can be picked up. If we move the magnetometer further to the left, it will start to pick up the magnetic field that's oriented downwards. So we can therefore see that the sensitivity of the magnetometer depends on its location relative to the source. And it is this feature that is exploited in smart sensor designs. One of these smart sensor designs is the axial radiometer. An axial radiometer consists of two coils placed on top of each other, along the axial direction with respect to the subject's head. It's the, the distance between these coils is typically about 5 cm. Importantly, the coils are wired in opposite direction to each other, and because of this, the magnetic fields in the two coils are subtracted from each other, making the radiometer sensitive to the difference in magnetic field strength. In our example, the bottom coil will be most sensitive to the brain, since it is closest to the brain. However, as you can see here in pink, both coils will also pick up ambient noise, that is in approximation uh, just as far away from both coils. In the single magnetometer situation, this noise would just have been added onto the measured brain signals. But with gradiometers, since both coils pick up this noise equally, it is removed in the measurement of the difference between the coils. This makes the gradiometer configuration a very efficient ambient noise suppressor. Yes. Um, another configuration that has similar uh, noise reduction properties is the planar gradiometer. As you can see here, the coils are again wired in opposition to each other, but are now oriented in the same plane. They cancel the effect of distant noise in a similar way as the actual gradiometer, but they have a different sensitivity profile when it comes to the distance to the source. Let me show you. When the planar gradiometer is positioned to the side of the source, it will be able to pick up some of its neural activity, while suppressing activity that it picks up further away from the source. However, they are most sensitive when they are positioned right above the source. In this example, the right coil will pick up the upward-oriented magnetic field, while a downward-oriented field will be picked up by the left coil. The difference between these coils will therefore be additive, and the total sensitivity much larger than when it was located on the side of the source. Uh, let me summarize now what we've learned by looking at the sensitivity profiles of the different coil configurations with respect to their distance to the source. First we described the magnetometer. It was shown to be most sensitive to a source when it was positioned right off its center, after which the sensitivity quickly declines with distance. Note, however, that it remains sensitive to distant magnetic fields. These could originate in principle from brain sources, but probably also contain a lot of noise. We then described how the actual gradiometer suppresses this distant noise better because its sensitivity to magnetic fields declines more rapidly with distance. And lastly, the planar gradiometer is another option for suppressing distant noise. 
it has a spatial profile that is most sensitive when it's located right above the source. Because of the ambient noise suppression, most MEG systems em employ these gradiometers rather than the magnetometers. Furthermore, most systems also use a handful of additional reference sensors. These are positioned at some distance from the sensor array and can be used to further uh, suppress noise by using a so-called third order gradient. Now, to see how these principles are actually implemented in MEG systems, let's walk through the three of the most common ones. The Electra Neuromach has 306 channels. 102 are magnetometers, 204 are planar gradiometers. Uh, the sensors are built using chips instead of wired coils. As you can see in this diagram, each chip has uh, three different coil configurations. First of all, in black, you can see a single square. This is the magnetometer. If you look closely, you can also see a figure of eight here in white. This is a planar gradiometer which is oriented vertically. Finally, in grey, you can see another horizontally oriented figure of eight gradiometer. If you have data recorded from such a system, you can really start appreciating the differences between magnetometers and gradiometers, because you will see that the sensitivity of these sensors are very different. It is it's therefore important to be aware of the fact that it's not just the magnetic fields that matter in MEG. The sensor design also influences how you will observe these magnetic fields. So going to the CTF system, uh, it has a completely different design. There are two main systems used at this moment, uh, 151 system and the 275 system, channel system, and they both use axial radiometers. It is difficult to make axial radiometers using chips, so instead coils are mounted along tubes on the inside of the MEG helmet. In production it is also harder therefore to get them perfectly oriented with respect to each other compared to the control that you have when you're making chips. Because of this the cancellation of ambient noise might be less successful. CTF systems therefore use additional reference sensors. As I said before these are magnetometers and gradiometers located at some more distance from the helmet. These are then used to pick up ambient noise and subtract it from the gradiometers by using a third order gradient. Now finally, the last system I'll, I'll shortly discuss is the 4D BTI system. Um, it uses magnetometers as well as reference sensors. And as we have seen, under relatively noise-free conditions, magnetometers are very sensitive to distant sources and can therefore pick up deeper brain activity than systems that use only gradiometers. But as you can appreciate by now, it really needs these reference sensors and they are shown here in red. This concludes our presentation of the basic principles of MEG recording. To summarize, with MEG we record magnetic fields that are produced by synchronized postsynaptic currents in the dendrites of pyramidal neurons. Magnetic fields are measured using flux transformers coupled to squids, both of which have to be at superconducting temperatures. This is achieved by using a dewer filled with liquid helium. MEG is very sensitive to environmental noise and it therefore has to use noise reduction techniques. For this purpose, recordings are done in a magnetically shielded room. Furthermore, MEG uses gradiometers and reference sensors instead of plain magnetometers. Several hundreds of these are typically used to get a whole head coverage and they are recorded at about a thousand hertz. Thank you for listening. I hope you learned something new today and hope to see you at the next video.